Hey everybody, this is Miss Beth. Happy Wow Wednesday. And today we are here at the west end of uh, Madison uh, along Highway 90 at the Emergency Medical Services Building. Uh, it's the big blue building on your right as you're going out of town. It houses all the ambulances and also the um, dispatch for the county 911. If you call 911, this is uh, where the phone call goes and they answer the phone here. Uh, and then they'll dispatch their ambulance, police, or uh, fire department. So today we're going to do uh, a tour of with some fire, a fire truck as well as an ambulance. Uh, so let's get started and happy Wow Wednesday. Hi, my name is Matt. I'm a firefighter with Madison County Fire Rescue. Uh, today we're going to be touring Engine 3. Uh, responds to most of our calls out of Greenville, but today it's up at the main station. Uh, like most fire engines, uh, the cab is very similar to a large truck. Uh, We have to let it cycle through before we turn on. This is where we do all of our light controls, pump operations, and our radio check. Also, oh, sorry. <laughs> don't forget to wear your seatbelt. Running through the engine. Uh, this engine is good because it is uh, able to pump and roll. It's good for structure fires, house fires, and even brush fires, depending on the situation. Uh, this is where we have some of our controls for the pump, and this is where we get our more advanced controls for the pump. This engine's attached with two attack lines that are great for structure fires. As we work our way through the engine, different extrication tools, along with extra hose lines, extra air bottles whenever they're accessible. This compartment is used mostly to hold cold water and extra extinguishers because you never want to get too hot on the fire. Coming back here. where we keep a lot of our big extrication tools in addition to ladders to help us get into high sources. Uh, also, we have a lot of cribbing, which is used to stabilize vehicles. Up top, several hundred feet of supply hose, uh, four inch and two and a half inch, and then an additional large attack line. Uh, these are used to pour water out of the uh, tank directly and also fill it up. Coming back here. extra gas to run tools, a hydraulic generator for the extra, extrication equipment, and then more cribbing because you can never have enough of this stuff. Uh, additional bottles. Here we're going to have most of our hand tools. We outline them so nobody forgets where they go. <laughs> Makes it easy for everybody. And our last compartment is where we're going to have our uh, K-12 saw used to cut through just about anything. Uh, our fan used to blow smoke out of any structures we may need and then some additional medical supplies. Coming back over here, this is where our lieutenant typically see, sits. Uh, right now it's filled with my gym clothes. Uh, in this seat, you have additional options to uh, adjust different kinds of uh, sirens with these foot pedals right here. As you can see, this knob up here, this switch down here, two very similar things. And then also the left. Oh. The only other thing would be a uh, small attack line we use to primarily uh, attack car fire, just because of its accessibility. It's right here, right on the front of the bus. Uh, yeah. This is a K-12 saw. It's used primarily to cut through uh, roof on houses and also has uh, additional attachments to cut through concrete. 
Um, it's great for making holes in roofs, to vent fires, and then really to get anywhere you have to get to. Uh, this is a very forceful hand when having to make entry. This is a ventilation fan. Uh, we only start these up after fire's been put out. It makes the uh, area a lot more accessible because smoke remains after fire's put out. Um, and These are hand tools typically you'll see firefighters carry into or at least outside of structure fires. You marry them together like this so they're easier to carry because yeah, one tool is easier to carry than two. Uh, so what would you use that thing for? This is a halligan. Uh, it's used primarily to uh, help us open hard to open doors. Uh, this wedge right here goes in between use this almost more like a hammer to uh, lodge it in and then just lever it. Uh, brooms are usually for car wrecks because there's glass everywhere. Shovel for shovel reasons. Bolt cutters because you'd be surprised how many places you get called to that are locked. And sledgehammer has many useful purposes usually which involves smashing. <laughs> so, this is commonly what we call a spreader or on TV it's called the jaws of life. Uh, today I don't have it hooked up, but it can extend, I think this one goes about two feet across. Uh, it's used to separate metal from itself. Uh, very useful for helping extricate patients from uh, wrecked parts. Cool. This is a cutter. Pretty much the same concept, except it cuts metal away from itself as opposed to just pushing it. Um, in case you haven't noticed, these are very heavy. The last one is a ram. It's kind of like a telescoping hydraulic tool that's used to also push away, but you have to have more uh, leverage with this one. My name is Michael Raines. I'm the deputy chief here at Madison County Fire Rescue. Um, and we're going to give you a tour of an ambulance. Um, to start off, I'd like to go over a couple things of when you should call 911. Um, emergencies consist of heart attacks, severe bleeding, strokes, things of that nature, um, stump toes, toothaches, things of that nature I don't recommend calling an ambulance for. Um, if you do have to call an ambulance, I would like to tell you to turn on your porch light and be sure you know your address if you have to call 911 because that's important. Um, so we'll start our tour here. Uh, this is the front of an ambulance. Um, you're probably looking at this computer here. What this is, that is our reporting system. That's how we do our reports. If we come to you, we have to keep record of everything we do for you and keep that for seven years um, so we always have record of what goes on um, the rest of this is really not that intriguing i would say due to it looks like a regular vehicle this is the control panel this is how all the lights work um, you flip these two switches it turns on the outside lights um, this turns on the generator in the back. Without the generator running, the back doesn't work. So we'll go ahead and crank that up. And this is the radio and the siren box. That's about it for the front end. All right. This compartment, this is where, as you see, we have some bolt cutters, kind of like the firefighters. Um, in case we have to go into somewhere that's locked, we have these, we can cut locks off of gates and things like that. This compartment mainly holds our O2 tank, which carries our oxygen, so if we have to give you oxygen in the back of the truck, that's where it's coming from out of that tank. In 
this compartment, we have a fancy piece of equipment we like to call our stair chair. The way this thing works, it's kind of like a chair here. So if we can't get a stretcher into your house, we can bring this in because it's a little more easy to maneuver around in your house. We put you in it, we'll strap you in, and then the uh, handle comes up and we'll just kind of set you back and roll you around like a wheelchair, so to speak. That's kind of the way that works. It just rolls around like a wheelchair. The cool thing about this is this has tracks on it right here that fold back. So when we go to go down your steps, what we'll do is we'll lean this back and it will, instead of bump, 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 it just makes a smooth ride down the steps. So that's kind of the, the way that thing there works. All right, so in this compartment, we have spare stretcher sheets. These are the sheets that go on the stretcher. Um, they get thrown away after every patient use so we're not cross-contaminating. So we do use disposable sheets, so that's where those are. Um, these fancy things are called headlocks or headbeds. Um, if you were ever in a traumatic incident and possibly have a cervical injury of the neck, we will put you on a backboard, which you will see in a few minutes. And then these go on and stabilize your head to keep it from moving around so we don't cause any further damage. Adult and child. This bag, kind of two things that go along with those headbands. These are known as cervical collars, or C collars. Um, also, traumatic uh, events with your, if you have trauma to your neck, we will put one of these on you. They're actually pretty cool to play with. Um, show you the way it works. It just, don't be scared if somebody comes out and want to use it. It does not hurt. It just goes around your neck like this and it keeps your head from moving around. You can't move your head, so that's what they're for. Um, so if you're ever in a traumatic event and you see someone coming at you with this, don't be scared. In the bottom compartment, we have our moving mats. Uh, in case you're in a really tight spot and we can't get the stair chair or anything else to you, this is a great big mat that we can put you on and it kind of wraps you up like a burrito and we can carry you down the hallway. So that's what that's for. Alright, and this down here we have what we call a peen board. Um, this is specifically for pediatric patients, um, your toddlers. Probably, I would say, two to four, two to five, depending on how old, how big they are. This is a backboard specifically for kids because you don't want to put them on a great big board when you've got a, a kid size one here. So, um, and this pouch is called a KED. Um, what it is, is it's pretty much a short backboard. So if we have to extricate you out of a car, this will go on you. Um, will go down behind your back. It's rigid so it doesn't move. So when we secure you in this, we're protecting your spine if there's any trauma to it so we're not doing any further damage. Um, it's for places that we can't get a long backboard into. This fancy piece of equipment is known as a traction splint. Um, the way this works is for broken legs. Actually, it's only used for a femur fracture. So this big bone right here in the top of your leg is the only time we would use this. So what happens when that bone breaks is it comes together because your muscles pull it this way and it causes a lot of pain. So we take this, we put it on you, and we pull it apart so those bones go back to where they're supposed to be and it's supposed to reduce pain. That's what this is used for. Pretty neat piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, in this compartment, you heard me talk about the long backboard or the long spine board. That is what this is. It's uh, if you 
have a back injury or you know out of a car wreck or if you fail more than likely we may put you on this board to keep from doing any further damage to your back nothing special it's just a big piece of plastic board they do float in water so if we have a boating accident or something like that uh, we can float people out of the water on these as well of an ambulance this is what the back of an ambulance looks like we have all kind of fancy equipment but the most used piece of equipment back here is this piece of machinery right here this is known as your cardiac monitor um, what we can do with this is we can put leads up to you we can see the, the electrical activity of your heart um, so that's how we know if you're having a heart attack or having a um, a rhythm disturbance of not, you know of your heart we can also check your blood pressure from this we can check your oxygen saturation from this um, this is what's known as a pulse ox so you put all that does is stick on your finger just like that and it'll pop up on this screen over here and it'll show you some numbers in a little waveform there's the number 97 percent is good 100 percent got my heart rate and then this is what we call a waveform of breathing um, we can diagnose a lot of things off of that waveform a piece of equipment right here is about $65,000 worth for, this, for just this piece of equipment um, in the cabinets up here we have our IV stuff. Um, if we have to give you IV fluids, this is what it comes looks like. Um, it's a bag of salt water, pretty much is what it is, but it's it's natural to the body, so that's what we put back in. Um, we carry that. This is all of our medications down here. Uh, we carry several different medications for uh, medications for heart dysrhythmias. We have medications for um, if if it was a drug overdose, we have medications to reverse that allergic reactions um, all kind of good stuff so we carry quite a bit in there this is a neat piece of equipment we have it's called a video lorenzoscope or a video scope and what this does is that we have to, if you're not breathing or not breathing adequately and we have to put a tube in your airway this is what we would use um, pretty high tech piece of equipment it turns on it's got your little screen and when it comes on it's it's a camera on the end as you can see so we would you know go into your airway with that we're watching this screen we can see everything we need to see on this piece of a handy equipment equipment if we have to put a tube in your airway 
We can use this to breathe for you. It's known as a ventilator. Um, so it hooks up to the oxygen. It just plugs into the wall, into the oxygen over here. And we do our little settings to what it's supposed to be, and it gives you a breath when it's supposed to and breathes for you. So that's what this piece of equipment does. This little box right here is about $9,000 worth. So is that like the ventilators you hear they talk about with the COVID folks being on ventilators? Yes, yes ma'am. It goes, it's the same thing. This one just probably isn't as high tech as the ones that they have in the hospital. We like to keep it simple out here in the field because we don't have labs and things of that nature. So they have a little more to go off of with their different settings and whatnot. So this is pretty much a base plane model. these cabinets this is where a lot of our um, bandaging stuff uh, we have cold packs in case you hurt you know get an injury we can put ice on it to keep the swelling down we also have heat packs if we need those to warm somebody up with most of this is just our bandaging stuff our galls our tape and stuff like that over here we have this fine fancy piece of equipment. It's actually pretty cool. This is known as a CPR device. Um, this one is called a Ross, particular one is called a Ross cube. But what this does is if you're, you or somebody goes into cardiac arrest, your heart stops beating and we have to do CPR on you. We can take this fancy machine we can hook it up. And this strap will unfold and it goes behind you. It comes back around and it hooks into these grooves and this sits in the center of your chest, just like this. And we pull it tight and then we can turn this on and it will start doing CPR for us so we can have our hands free to do something else. So that, that is your chest compression. Yes, ma'am. Chest compression. So we're not stuck doing them. We can have our hands free to push medications or whatever else we may need to do as we're going down the road. This wow. will actually do chest compressions for us. To the, to the rhythm of, what was the song? Staying alive. Staying alive, yeah. That is right. cool. So that's a pretty cool piece of equipment there. Um, this is an airway bag. It's got all of our airway stuff in it. So if we pull up on a call that we know is going to consist of airway, we can grab this bag and it has everything in it that we need to take care of an airway emergency. Um, oxygen. It has our breathing tubes in it. If we have to put a breathing tube down, we have those in here. Um, this is called a BVM or a bag valve mask. This is our manual ventilator, so to speak. Um, if we don't use the machine, we put this on there and we, we squeeze it and breathe for you through this. So that's our airway bag. That's about the coolest things in there. This is known as our trauma slash medical bag. Um, it has anything in here that we need to take care of just about anything. Um, bandaging stuff, it has our tourniquets in there. Um, if you don't know what a tourniquet is, this is if you have a severe bleed, like if you cut your arm and it won't quit bleeding, we can take this and put it on your arm and cut the circulation off so the bleeding will stop. So that's what a tourniquet is these on every truck and every bag in case we need them. Um, this side's got some more airway things in it. That little thing there is known as a king airway. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. That goes down in your, this is a blind insertion airway. 
it goes down and we blow up these two little balloons and it seals everything off and only lets air go into the lungs. So that's kind of what that looks like. Just some more, we have our packs in here that has some more of our IV stuff in them. And that's about it. The only other cool thing we have is this thing right here. That is our safe. Um, if we need to lock up medications or anything like that, it doesn't need to be out to the general public. They can just get in here and get a hold of anything. This is our safe. You cannot get in that unless you have a thumbprint installed into it. Um, so if I put my fingerprint on there, it pops my name up and I can get access and it has medications in there. Um, so I know who went in and out of that safe at all times. Cool. Wow, we got one more cool thing. <laughs> this piece of equipment is called a IO or an easy IO bone drill. What this does is if we can't start an IV in one of your veins, if you need fluids or blood or anything like that, and we can't get it in one of your veins, we can use this, which is a drill. We put one of these needles on the end of it, it sticks on the end, and we come down here to your leg and your bone and we drill that into your bone. Okay, we don't use this every day. This is only for certain situations. Um, it's got to be life or death pretty much before we use this. So I would hope so. Use. I not would hope so. That, that doesn't sound very good. Believe it or not, they say it does not hurt until you push something through into the bone marrow. Um, but that's why we have lidocaine. We push that first, it gums everything up, so it's painless. This is our IV box. Um, we can take this inside of a house. It has our IV stuff in it. You heard me talk about putting IV in your veins. That's what this looks like. Um, this is what they call an IV catheter. It opens up. This is what it looks like. It has a needle here. And then this is what's actually the catheter that will stay in your vein. The needle doesn't stay there, just the plastic. So, we would start it in the vein, we would push it in, and then this piece comes off. You hit a button, the needle goes away, so we're not sticking people with a needle. And this is actually what stays in your vein. That, and the fluid or blood or medication that you're getting actually goes in through this into your bloodstream, into your system. So that's what those look like. Um, they come in all different shapes. This is actually one of the smaller ones. It's a 22 gauge. But they go all the way up to a 14 gauge, which is almost a small water hose. <laughs> <laughs> uh. um, we carry aspirin in this box. This is for chest pain patients. If you're having chest pain, um, we give you aspirin to help thin your blood out, keep it flowing, um, hopefully to keep you from having a heart attack. We have nitro tabs or nitro pills in this box. These are for chest pain as well. It's what they call a vasodilator. So meaning if I give you one of these, it makes your vessels get bigger so your blood flows easier and hopefully it takes stress off of your heart, which relieves the chest pain. Down here is just some more spare things. Um, bandaging stuff, some more aspirin, extra needles, and things of that nature. We do have a thermometer. We check your temperature. It goes in, goes under your tongue. We get your temperature, or we can do it under your arm either way. So pretty much, we're like a rolling emergency room. Um, we have just about everything in here that an emergency room does. Um, with an exception of some things, but we can do pretty much anything back here that we need to to keep you alive until we can get you where you need to go. 
So, so Mr. Reigns, tell me, how long have you been doing this with the uh, with Android? I have been in the Android service for 18 years. Wow. Um, started back in 2002 when I became an EMT, um, which is the low entry level into this field. You can only do basic life support things when you're an EMT, such as bandaging um, and driving, pretty much. <laughs> CPR, things of that nature. And then I became a paramedic in 2006, which gives you free reign to start IVs, uh, read cardiac rhythms, push medications, things of that nature. And I've been doing that ever since. But I am now in the role of deputy chief. Um, so I don't get in the back of an ambulance very much anymore. Most of my day consists of paperwork. Oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> so, uh, so is a, uh, um what do they have to do to become an EMT and a paramedic? Um, actually, we have North Florida College here in town. They do an EMT program, and they also do a paramedic program. Um, you can go right into the EMT program after you graduate high school. You have to be 18 to actually get into the program. Um, they've changed the length on some of them. EMT used to be one semester, so about four months go through the class and you have to pass a, a national test now to become and get a license as an EMT. And then after you begin your EMT, you can go into paramedic school. Paramedic school now is 14 months long. Um, you, you go through class, you ride clinicals on ambulances, you do all your skills and things like that, but it's offered right there in North Florida. Wow, so right here, you can get a job right here. Yes ma'am. Always looking for help. That's kind of what I thought. <laughs> so, so it's a it's a good field to get into if you want to help people. You want to uh, get a job right here in Madison. Um, I will add though, this is not a job that you will get rich in. I promise you. You have to have a passion for people, helping people, um, and have a, a desire to do this job because it pays good money, but you're not going to get rich. Well. That's what helping people usually is like education, That's right. you know, healthcare. So, well, Mr. Range, thank you so much for, for showing us all this today. Um, and all right. So for Wow Wednesday, this is Miss Beth signing off.